Chapter 2. A History of Money and Banking in the United States Before the Twentieth Century As an outpost of Great Britain, colonial America, of course, used British pounds, pence, and shillings as its money. Great Britain was officially on a silver standard, with the shilling defined as equal to 86 pure troy grains of silver, and with silver as so defined legal tender for all debts, i.e. creditors were compelled to accept silver at that rate. However, Britain also coined gold and maintained a bimetallic standard by fixing the gold guinea, weighing 129.4 grains of gold, as equal in value to a certain weight of silver. In that way, gold became, in effect, legal tender as well. Unfortunately, by establishing bimetallism, Britain became perpetually subject to the evils known as Gresham's Law, which states that when government compulsorily overvalues one money and undervalues another, the undervalued money will leave the country or disappear into hordes, while the overvalued money will flood into circulation. Hence, the popular catchphrase of Gresham's Law, bad money drives out good. But the important point to note is that the triumph of bad money is the result, not of perverse free market competition, but of government using the compulsory legal tender power to privilege one money above another. In 17th and 18th century Britain, the government maintained a meant ratio between gold and silver that consistently overvalued gold and undervalued silver in relation to world market prices, with the resultant disappearance and outflow of full-bodied silver coins and an influx of gold, and the maintenance in circulation of only eroded and lightweight silver coins. Attempts to rectify the fixed bimetallic ratios were always too little and too late. In the sparsely settled American colonies, money, as it always does, arose in the market as a useful and scarce commodity and began to serve as a general medium of exchange. Thus, beaver fur and wampum were used as money in the north for exchanges with the Indians, and fish and corn also served as money. Rice was used as money in South Carolina, and the most widespread use of commodity money was tobacco, which served as money in Virginia. The pound of tobacco was the currency unit in Virginia, with warehouse receipts in tobacco circulating as money backed 100% by the tobacco in the warehouse. While commodity money continued to serve satisfactorily in rural areas, as the colonial economy grew, Americans imported gold and silver coins to serve as monetary media in urban centers and in foreign trade. English coins were imported, but so too were gold and silver coins from other European countries. Among the gold coins circulating in America were the French guinea, the Portuguese Joe, the Spanish doubloon, and Brazilian coins, while silver coins included French crowns and livres. It is important to realize that gold and silver are international commodities, and that, therefore, when not prohibited by government decree, foreign coins are perfectly capable of serving as standard monies. There is no need to have a national government monopolize the coinage and indeed foreign gold and silver coins constituted much of the coinage in the United States until Congress outlawed the use of foreign coins in 1857. Thus, if a free market is allowed to prevail in a country, foreign coins will circulate naturally. Silver and gold coins will tend to be valued in proportion to their respective weights, and the ratio between silver and gold will be set by the market in accordance with their relative supply and demand. Shilling-Dollar Manipulations By far the leading specie coin circulating in America was the Spanish silver dollar, defined as consisting of 387 grains of pure silver. The dollar was divided into pieces of eight, or bits, each consisting of one-eighth of a dollar. Spanish dollars came into the North American colonies through the lucrative trade with the West Indies. The Spanish silver dollar had been the world's outstanding coin since the early 16th century, 
and was spread partially by dint of the vast silver output of the Spanish colonies in Latin America. More important, however, was the fact that the Spanish dollar, from the 16th to the 19th century, was relatively the most stable and least debased coin in the Western world. Since the Spanish silver dollar consisted of 387 grains, and the English shilling consisted of 86 grains of silver, this meant the natural free market ratio between the two coins would be 4 shillings, 6 pence per dollar. Constant complaints both by contemporaries and by some later historians arose about an alleged scarcity of money, especially of specie, in the colonies, allegedly justifying numerous colonial paper money schemes to remedy that shortage. In reality, there was no such shortage. It is true that England, in a mercantilist attempt to hoard specie, kept minting for its own prerogative and outlawed minting in the colonies. It also prohibited the export of English coin to America. But this did not keep specie from America, for, as we have seen, Americans were able to import Spanish and other foreign coin, including English, from other countries. Indeed, as we shall see, it was precisely paper money issues that led, by Gresham's law, to outflows and disappearance of specie from the colonies. In their own mercantilism, the colonial governments early tried to hoard their own specie by debasing their shilling standards in terms of Spanish dollars. Whereas their natural weights dictated a ratio of four shillings per sixpence to the dollar, Massachusetts, in 1642, began a general colonial process of competitive debasement of shillings. Massachusetts arbitrarily decreed the Spanish dollar be valued at five shillings. The idea was to attract an inflow of Spanish silver dollars into that colony, and to subsidize Massachusetts' exports by making their prices cheaper in terms of dollars. Soon, Connecticut and other colonies followed suit, each persistently upping the ante of debasement. The result was to increase the supply of nominal units of account by debasing the shilling, inflating domestic prices, and thereby bringing the temporary export stimulus to a rapid end. Finally, the English government brought a halt to this futile and inflationary practice in 1707. But the colonial governments had already found another and far more inflationary arrow for their bow the invention of government fiat paper money. Government paper money. Apart from medieval China, which invented both paper and printing centuries before the West, the world had never seen government paper money until the colonial government of Massachusetts emitted a fiat paper issued in 1690. Massachusetts was accustomed to launching plunder expeditions against the prosperous French colony in Quebec. Generally, the expeditions were successful and would return to Boston, sell their booty, and pay off the soldiers with the proceeds. This time, however, the expedition was beaten back decisively, and the soldiers returned to Boston in ill humor, grumbling for their pay. Discontented soldiers are ripe for mutiny, so the Massachusetts government looked around in concern for a way to pay the soldiers. It tried to borrow three to four thousand pounds from Boston merchants, but evidently Massachusetts' credit rating was not the best. Finally, Massachusetts decided in December 1690 to print seven thousand pounds in paper notes and to use them to pay the soldiers. Suspecting that the public would not accept irredeemable paper, the government made a twofold pledge when it issued the notes that it would redeem them in gold or silver out of tax revenues in a few years, and that absolutely no further paper notes would be issued. Characteristically, however, both parts of the pledge went quickly by the board. The issue limit disappeared in a few months, and all the bills continued unredeemed for nearly 40 years. As early as February 1691, the Massachusetts government proclaimed that its issue had fallen far short and so it proceeded to emit 40,000 pounds of new money to repay all of its outstanding debt, again pledging falsely that this would be absolutely the final note issue. But Massachusetts found that the increase in the supply of money 
coupled with a fall in the demand for paper because of growing lack of confidence in future redemption in specie, led to a rapid depreciation of new money in relation to specie. Indeed, in a year after the initial issue, the new paper pound had depreciated on the market by 40% against specie. By 1692, the government moved against this market evaluation by use of force, making the paper money compulsory legal tender for all debts at par with specie, and by granting a premium of 5% on all payments of debts to the government made in paper notes. This legal tender law had the unwanted effect of Gresham's Law, the disappearance of specie circulation in the colony. In addition, the expanding paper issues drove up prices and hampered exports from the colony. In this way, the specie shortage became the creature rather than the cause of the fiat paper issues. Thus, in 1690, before the orgy of paper issue began, 200,000 pounds of silver money was available in New England. By 1711, however, with Connecticut and Rhode Island having followed suit in paper money issue, 240,000 pounds of paper money had been issued in New England, but the silver had almost disappeared from circulation. Ironically, then, Massachusetts and her sister colony's issue of paper created, rather than solved, any scarcity of money. The new paper drove out old specie. The consequent driving up of prices and depreciation of paper scarcely relieved any alleged money scarcity among the public. But since the paper was issued to finance government expenditures and pay public debts, the government, not the public, benefited from the fiat issue. After Massachusetts had emitted another huge issue of 500,000 pounds in 1711 to pay for another failed expedition against Quebec, not only was the remainder of the silver driven from circulation, but despite the legal tender law, the paper pound depreciated 30% against silver. Massachusetts pounds, officially seven shillings to the silver ounce, had now fallen on the market to nine shillings per ounce. Depreciation proceeded in this and other colonies despite fierce governmental attempts to outlaw it. Backed by fines, imprisonment, and total confiscation of property for the high crime of not accepting the paper at par. Faced with a further shortage of money due to the money issues, Massachusetts decided to press on. In 1716, it formed a government land bank and issued 100,000 pounds in notes to be loaned on real estate in the various counties of the province. Prices rose so dramatically that the tide of opinion in Massachusetts began to turn against paper, as writers pointed out that the result of the issues was a doubling of prices in the past 20 years, depreciation of paper, and the disappearance of Spanish silver through the operation of Gresham's Law. From then on, Massachusetts, pressured by the Crown, tried intermittently to reduce the bills in circulation and return to a specie currency, but was hampered by its assumed obligations to honor the paper notes at par of its sister New England colonies. In 1744, another losing expedition against the French led Massachusetts to issue an enormous amount of paper money over the next several years. From 1744 to 1748, paper money in circulation expanded from 300,000 pounds to 2.5 million pounds, and the depreciation of Massachusetts was such that silver had risen on the market to 60 shillings an ounce, ten times the price at the beginning of an era of paper money in 1690. By 1740, every colony but Virginia had followed suit in fiat paper money issues, and Virginia succumbed in the late 1750s in trying to finance part of the French and Indian War against the French. Similar consequences, dramatic inflation, shortage of specie, massive depreciation despite compulsory par laws, ensued in each colony. Thus, Along with Massachusetts' depreciation of 11 to 1 of its notes against specie compared to the original par, Connecticut's notes had sunk to 9 to 1 and the Carolinas at 10 to 1 in 1740, 
and the paper currently inflationist Rhode Island had sunk to 23 to 1 against specie. Even the least inflated paper, that of Pennsylvania, had suffered an appreciation of specie to 80% over par. A detailed study of the effects of paper money in New Jersey shows how it created a boom-bust economy over the colonial period. When new paper money was injected into the economy, an inflationary boom would result, to be followed by a deflationary depression when the paper money supply contracted. At the end of King George's War with France in 1748, Parliament began to pressure the colonies to retire the mass of paper money and return to a specie currency. In 1751, Great Britain prohibited all further issues of legal tender paper in New England and ordered a move toward redemption of existing issues in specie. Finally, in 1764, Parliament extended the prohibition of new issues to the remainder of the colonies and required the gradual retirement of outstanding notes. Following the lead of Parliament, the New England colonies, apart from Rhode Island, decided to resume specie payment and retire their paper notes rapidly at the current depreciated market rate. The panicky opponents of specie resumption and monetary contraction made the usual predictions in such a situation that the result would be a virtual absence of money in New England and the consequent ruination of all trade. Instead, however, after a brief adjustment, the resumption and retirement led to a far more prosperous trade and production, the harder money and lower prices attracting an inflow of specie. In fact, with Massachusetts on specie and Rhode Island still on depreciated paper, the result was that Newport, which had been a flourishing center for West Indian imports for western Massachusetts, lost its trade to Boston and languished in the doldrums. In fact, as one student of colonial Massachusetts has pointed out, the return to specie occasioned remarkably little dislocation, recession, or price deflation. Indeed, Wheat prices fell by less in Boston than in Philadelphia, which saw no such return to specie in the early 1750s. Foreign exchange rates after the resumption of specie were highly stable, and the restored specie system operated after 1750 with remarkable stability during the Seven Years' War and during the dislocation of international payments in the last years before the Revolution. Not being outlawed by government decree, specie remained in circulation throughout the colonial period, even during the operation of paper money. Despite the inflation, booms and busts, and shortages of specie caused by paper issues, the specie system worked well overall. Here was a silver standard. In the absence of institutions of the central government intervening in the silver market and in the absence of either a public or private central bank adjusting domestic credit or managing a reserve of specie or foreign exchange with which to stabilize exchange rates. The market kept exchange rates remarkably close to the legislated par. What is most remarkable in this context is the continuity of the specie system through the 17th and 18th centuries. Private Banknotes In contrast to government paper, private banknotes and deposits redeemable in specie had begun in Western Europe in Venice in the 14th century. Firms granting credit to consumers and businesses had existed in the ancient world and in medieval Europe, but these were money lenders who loaned out their own savings. Banking, in the sense of lending out savings of others, only began in England with the Scriveners of the early 17th century. The Scriveners were clerks who wrote contracts and bonds and were therefore in a position to learn of mercantile transactions and engage in money lending and borrowing. There were, however, no banks of deposit in England until the Civil War in the mid-17th century. Merchants had been in the habit of storing their surplus gold in the king's mint for safekeeping. The habit proved to be unfortunate, for when Charles I needed money in 1638, shortly before the outbreak of the Civil War, he confiscated a huge sum of 200,000 pounds in gold, calling it a loan from the owners. Although the merchants finally got their gold back, they were understandably shaken by the experience and forsook the mint, 
depositing their gold instead in the coffers of private goldsmiths, who, like the Mint, were accustomed to storing the valuable metal. The warehouse receipts of the goldsmiths soon came to be used as a surrogate for the gold itself. By the end of the Civil War, in the 1660s, the goldsmiths fell prey to the temptation to print pseudo-warehouse receipts not covered by gold and lend them out. In this way, fractional reserve banking came to England. Very few private banks existed in colonial America, and they were short-lived. Most prominent was the Massachusetts Land Bank of 1740, issuing notes and lending them out on real estate. The Land Bank was launched as an inflationary alternative to government paper, which the royal governor was attempting to restrict. The Land Bank issued, frankly, irredeemable notes, and fear of its unsound issue generated a competing private silver bank, which emitted notes redeemable in silver. The Land Bank promptly issued over 49,000 pounds in irredeemable notes, which depreciated very rapidly. In six months' time, the public was almost universally refusing to accept the bank's notes and land bank sympathizers vainly accepting the notes. The final blow came in 1741, when Parliament, acting at the request of several Massachusetts merchants and the royal governor, outlawed both the law and the silver banks. One intriguing aspect of both the Massachusetts Land Bank and other inflationary colonial schemes is that they were advocated and lobbied for by some of the wealthiest merchants and land speculators in the respective colonies. Debtors benefit from inflation and creditors lose. Realizing this fact, older historians assumed that debtors were largely poor agrarians and creditors were wealthy merchants and that, therefore, the former were the main sponsors of the inflationary nostrums. But, of course, there are no rigid classes of debtors and creditors. Indeed, wealthy merchants and land speculators are often the heaviest debtors. Later historians have demonstrated that members of the latter group were the major sponsors of inflationary paper money in the colonies. Revolutionary War Finance To finance the Revolutionary War, which broke out in 1775, the Continental Congress early hit on the device of issuing fiat paper money. The leader in the drive for paper money was Governor Morris the highly conservative young scion of the New York landed aristocracy. There was no pledge to redeem the paper, even in the future, but it was supposed to be retired in seven years by taxes levied pro rata by the separate states. Thus, the heavy future tax burden was supposed to be added to the inflation brought about by the new paper money. The retirement pledge, however, was soon forgotten, as Congress, enchanted by this new seemingly costless form of revenue, escalated its emissions of fiat paper. As a historian has phrased it, such was the beginning of the federal trough, one of America's most imperishable institutions. The total money supply of the United States at the beginning of the Revolution has been estimated at $12 million. Congress launched its first paper issue of $2 million in late June 1775, and before the notes were printed, it had already concluded that another $1 million was needed. Before the end of the year, a full $6 million in paper issues were issued or authorized. A dramatic increase of 50% in the money supply in one year. The issue of this fiat continental paper rapidly escalated over the next few years, Congress issued $6 million in 1775, $19 million in 1776, $13 million in 1777, $64 million in 1778, and $125 million in 1779. This was a total issue of over $225 million in five years, superimposed upon pre-existing money supply of $12 million. The result was, as could be expected, a rapid price inflation in terms of the paper notes and a corollary accelerating depreciation of the paper in terms of specie. Thus, by the end of 1776, the Continentals were worth $1 to $1.25 in specie. 
By the fall of the following year, its value had fallen to three to one. By December 1778, the value was 6.8 to one, and by December 1779, to the negligible 42 to one. By the spring of 1781, the Continentals were virtually worthless, exchanging on the market at 168 paper dollars to one dollar in specie. This collapse of the continental currency gave rise to the phrase, not worth a continental. To top this calamity, the several states issued their own paper money and each depreciated at varying rates. Virginia and the Carolinas led the inflationary move, and by the end of the war, state issues added a total of 210 million depreciated dollars to the nation's currency. In an attempt to stem the inflation, and depreciation, various states levied maximum price controls and compulsory par laws. The result was only to create shortages and impose hardships on large sections of the public. Thus, soldiers were paid in continentals, but farmers, understandably, refused to accept payment in paper money, despite legal coercion. The Continental Army then moved to impress food and other supplies. Seizing the supplies and forcing the farmers and shopkeepers to accept depreciated paper in return. By 1779, with continental paper virtually worthless, the Continental Army stepped up its impressments, paying for them in newly issued paper tickets or certificates issued by the Army Quartermaster and Commissary Departments. The states followed suit with their own massive certificate issues. It understandably took little time for these certificates federal, and state, to depreciate in value to nothing. By the end of the war, federal certificate issues alone totaled $200 million. The one redeeming feature of this monetary calamity was that the federal and state governments at least allowed these paper issues to sink into worthlessness without insisting that taxpayers shoulder another grave burden by being forced to redeem these issues specie at par, or even to redeem them at all. Continentals were not redeemed at all, and state paper was only redeemed at depreciating rates, some at the greatly depreciated market value. By the end of the war, all the wartime state paper had been withdrawn from circulation. Unfortunately, the same policy was not applied to another important device that Congress turned to after its continental paper had become almost worthless in 1779, loan certificates. Technically, loan certificates were public debt. They were scarcely genuine loans. They were simply notes issued by the government to pay for supplies and accepted by the merchants because the government would not pay anything else. Hence, the loan certificates became a form of currency and rapidly depreciated. As early as the end of 1779, they had depreciated to 24 to 1 in specie. By the end of the war, $600 million of loan certificates had been issued. Some of the later loan certificate issues were liquidated at a depreciated rate, but the bulk remained after the war to become the substantial core of the permanent peacetime federal debt. The mass of federal and state debt could have depreciated and passed out of existence by the end of the war, but the process was stopped and reversed by Robert Morris wealthy Philadelphia merchant and virtual economic and financial czar of the Continental Congress in the last years of the war. Morris, leader of the nationalist forces in American politics, moved to make the depreciated federal debt ultimately redeemable in par and also agitated for federal assumption of the various state debts. The reason was twofold a. to confer a vast subsidy on speculators who had purchased the public debt at highly depreciated values by paying interest and principal at par in specie, and b. to build up the agitation for taxing power in the Congress, which the Articles of Confederation refused to allow to the federal government. The decentralist policy of the states raising taxes or issuing new paper money to pay off the pro rata federal debt as well as their own was thwarted by the adoption of the Constitution, which brought about the victory of the nationalist program led by Morris's youthful disciple and former aide, Alexander Hamilton. <laughs>
the Bank of North America. Robert Morris's nationalist vision was not confined to a strong central government. The power of the federal government to tax and a massive public debt fastened permanently upon the taxpayers Shortly after he assumed total economic power in Congress in the spring of 1781, Morris introduced a bill to create the first commercial bank, as well as the first central bank in the history of the New Republic. This bank, headed by Morris himself, the Bank of North America was not only the first fractional reserve commercial bank in the U.S., it was to be a privately owned central bank, modeled after the Bank of England. The money system was to be grounded upon specie, but with a controlled monetary inflation pyramiding an expansion of money and credit upon a reserve of specie. The Bank of North America, which quickly received a federal charter and opened its doors at the beginning of 1782, received the privilege from the government of its notes being receivable in all duties and taxes to all governments at par with specie. In addition, no other banks were to be permitted to operate in the country. In return for its monopoly license to issue paper money, the bank would graciously lend most of its newly created money to the federal government to purchase public debt and be reimbursed by the hapless taxpayer. The Bank of North America was made the depository for all congressional funds. The first central bank in America rapidly loaned $1.2 million to the Congress headed also by Robert Morris. Despite Robert Morris's power and influence and the monopoly privileges conferred upon his bank, it was perceived in the market that the bank's notes were being inflated compared with specie. Despite the nominal redeemability of the Bank of North America's notes in specie, the market's lack of confidence in the inflated notes led to their depreciation outside its home base in Philadelphia. The bank even tried to shore up the value of its notes by hiring people to urge redeemers of its notes not to ruin everything by insisting upon specie, a move scarcely calculated to improve ultimate confidence in the bank. After a year of operation, however, Morris, his political power slipping after the end of the war, moved quickly to end his bank's role as a central bank and to shift it to the status of a private commercial bank chartered by the state of Pennsylvania. By the end of 1783, all of the federal government stock in the Bank of North America, which had the previous year amounted to five-eighths of its capital, had been sold by Morris into private hands, and all the U.S. government debt to the bank had been repaid. The first experiment with a central bank in the United States had ended. At the end of the Revolutionary War, the contraction of the swollen mass of paper money combined with the resumption of imports from Great Britain, combined to cut prices by more than half in a few years. Vain attempts by seven state governments in the mid-1780s to cure the shortage of money and reinflate prices were a complete failure. Part of the reason for the state paper issues was a frantic attempt to pay the wartime public debt, state, and pro rata federal without resorting to crippling burdens of taxation. The increased paper issues merely added to the shortage by stimulating the export of specie and the import of commodities from abroad. Once again, Gresham's law was at work. State paper issues, despite compulsory par laws, merely depreciated rapidly and aggravated the shortage of specie. A historian discusses what happened to the paper issues of North Carolina. In 1787-1788, the specie value of the paper had shrunk by more than 50%. Coin vanished, and since the paper had practically no value outside the state, merchants could not use it to pay debts they owed abroad. Hence, they suffered severe losses when they had to accept it at inflated values in the settlement of local debts. North Carolina's performance warned merchants anew of the menace of depreciating paper money, which they were forced to receive at par from their debtors, but which they could not pass on to their creditors. Neither was the situation helped by the expansion of banking following the launch of the Bank of North America in 1782. The Bank of New York and the Massachusetts Bank, Boston, followed two years later, with each institution enjoying a monopoly of banking in its region. 
Their expansion of banknotes and deposits helped to drive out specie, and in the following year the expansion was succeeded by a contraction of credit, which aggravated the problems of recession. The United States, Bimetallic Coinage Since the Spanish silver dollar was the major coin circulating in North America during the colonial and confederation periods, it was generally agreed that the dollar would be the basic currency unit of the new United States of America. Article I, Section 8 of the new Constitution gave to Congress the power to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and of foreign coin. The power was exclusive because the state governments were prohibited, in Article I, Section 10, from coining money, emitting paper money, or making anything but gold and silver coin legal tender in payment of debts. Evidently, the Founding Fathers were mindful of the bleak record of colonial and revolutionary paper issues and provincial juggling of the weights and denominations of coin. In accordance with this power, Congress passed the Coinage Act of 1792 on the recommendation of Secretary of Treasury Alexander Hamilton's report on the establishment of a mint of the year before. The Coinage Act established a bimetallic dollar standard for the United States. The dollar was defined as both a weight of 371.25 grains of pure silver and or a weight of 24.75 grains of pure gold a fixed ratio of 15 grains of silver to one grain of gold. Anyone could bring gold and silver bullion to the mint to be coined, and silver and gold coins were both to be legal tender at this fixed ratio of 15 to 1. The basic silver coin was to be the silver dollar, the basic gold coin the $10 eagle containing 247.5 grains of pure gold. The 15 to 1 fixed bimetallic ratio almost precisely corresponded to the market gold-silver ration of the early 1790s, but of course the tragedy of any bimetallic standard is that the fixed mint ratio must always come a cropper against inevitably changing market ratios, and that Gresham's law will then come inexorably into effect. Thus, Hamilton's express desire to keep both metals in circulation in order to increase the supply of money was doomed to failure. Unfortunately for the bimetallic gold, the 1780s saw the beginning of a steady decline in the ratio of the market values of silver to gold. Largely due to the massive increases over the next three decades of silver production from the mines of Mexico. The result was that the market ratio fell to 15.5 to 1 by the 1790s, and after 1805 fell to approximately 15.75 to 1. The latter figure was enough of a gap between the market and mint ratios to set Gresham's Law into operation, so that by 1810 gold coins began to disappear from the United States and silver coins to flood in. The fixed government ratio now significantly overvalued silver and undervalued gold, and so it paid people to bring in silver to exchange for gold, melt the gold coins into bullion, and ship it abroad. From 1810 until 1834, only silver coin, domestic and foreign, circulated in the United States. Originally, Congress, in 1793, provided that all foreign coins circulating in the United States be legal tender. Indeed, foreign coins have been estimated to form 80% of American domestic species circulation in 1800. Most of the foreign coins were Spanish silver, and while the legal tender privilege was progressively canceled for various foreign coins by 1827, Spanish silver coins continued as legal tender and to predominate in circulation. Spanish dollars, however, soon began to be heavier in weight by 1 to 5 percent over their American equivalents, even though they circulated at face value here, and so the American mint ratio overvalued American more than Spanish dollars. As a result, the Spanish silver dollars were re-exported, leaving American silver dollars in circulation. On the other hand, fractional Spanish silver coins, half dollars, quarter dollars, dimes, and half dimes, were considerably overvalued in the U.S. since they circulated at face value and yet were far lighter weight. Gresham's Law again came into play, and the result was the American silver fractional coins were exported and disappeared. <laughs>
leaving Spanish silver fractional coins as the major currency. To make matters still more complicated, American silver dollars, though lighter weight than the Spanish, circulated equally by name in the West Indies. As a result, American silver dollars were exported to the Caribbean. Thus, by the complex workings of Gresham's law, the United States was left, especially after 1820, with no gold coins and only Spanish fractional silver coin in circulation. The First Bank of the United States, 1791 to 1811 A linchpin of the Hamiltonian financial program was a central bank, the First Bank of the United States, replacing the abortive Bank of North America experiment. Hamilton's Report on a National Bank of December 1790 urged such a bank to be owned privately, with the government owning one-fifth of the shares. Hamilton argued that the alleged scarcity of specie currency needed to be overcome by infusions of paper, and the new bank was to issue such paper, to be invested in the assumed federal debt and in subsidy to manufacturers. The bank notes were to be legally redeemable in specie on demand, and its notes were to be kept at par with specie by the federal governments accepting its notes in taxes, giving it a quasi-legal tender status. Also, the federal government would confer upon the bank the prestige of being a depository for its public funds. In accordance with Hamilton's wishes, Congress quickly established the First Bank of the United States in February 1791. The charter of the bank was for 20 years, and it was assured a monopoly of the privilege of having a national charter during that period. In a significant gesture of continuity with the Bank of North America, the latter's longtime president and former partner of Robert Morris, Thomas Willing of Philadelphia, was made president of the new Bank of the United States. The Bank of the United States promptly fulfilled its inflationary potential by issuing millions of dollars in paper money and demand deposits, pyramiding on top of $2 million in specie. The Bank of the United States invested heavily in loans to the United States government. In addition to $2 million invested in the assumption of pre-existing long-term debt assumed by the new federal government, the Bank of the United States engaged in massive temporary lending to the government, which reached $6.2 million by 1796. The result of the outpouring of credit and paper money by the new Bank of the United States was an inflationary rise in prices. Thus, wholesale prices rose from an index of 85 in 1791 to a peak of 146 in 1796, an increase of 72 percent. In addition, speculation boomed in government securities and real estate values were driven upward. Pyramiding on top of the Bank of the United States expansion and aggravating the paper money expansion and the inflation was a flood of newly created commercial banks. Whereas there were only three commercial banks before the founding of the United States, and only four by the establishment of the Bank of the United States, eight new banks were founded shortly thereafter. In 1791 and 1792, and ten more by 1796, Thus, the Bank of the United States and its monetary expansion spurred the creation of 18 new banks in five years. The establishment of the Bank of the United States precipitated a grave constitutional argument, the Jeffersonians arguing that the Constitution gave the federal government no power to establish a bank. Hamilton, in turn, paved the way for virtually unlimited expansion of federal power by maintaining that the Constitution implied a grant of power for carrying out vague national goals. The Hamiltonian interpretation won out officially in the decision of Supreme Court Justice John Marshall in McCulloch v. Maryland, 1819. Despite the Jeffersonian hostility to commercial and central banks, the Democratic Republicans, under the control of quasi-federalist moderates rather than militant old Republicans, made no move to repeal the charter of the Bank of the United States before its expiration in 1811, and happily multiplied the number of state banks and bank credit in the next two decades. Thus, in 1800 there were 28 state banks, by 1811, the number had escalated to 117, a four-fold increase. In 
In 1804, there were 64 state banks, of which we have data on 13, or 20% of the banks. These reporting banks had $0.98 million in specie as against notes and demand deposits outstanding of $2.82 million, a reserve ratio of 0.35, or a notes plus deposits pyramiding on top of specie of 2.88 to 1. By 1811, 26% of the 117 banks reported a total of $2.57 million. But the two-and-a-half-fold increase in specie was more than matched by an emission of $10.95 million of notes and deposits, a nearly four-fold increase. This constituted a pyramiding of 4.26 to 1 on top of specie, or a reserve ratio of these banks of 0.23. As for the Bank of the United States, which acted in conjunction with the federal government and with the state banks, in January 1811 it had specie assets of $5.01 million and notes and deposits outstanding of $12.87 million, a pyramid ratio of 2.57 to 1, or a reserve ratio of 0.39. Finally, when the time for rechartering the Bank of the United States came in 1811, the recharter bill was defeated by one vote each in the House and Senate. Recharter was fought for by the Madison administration, aided by nearly all the Federalists in Congress, but was narrowly defeated by the bulk of the Democratic Republicans, including the hard-money old Republican forces. In view of the widely held misconception among historians that central banks serve and are looked upon as restraints upon state or private bank inflation, it is instructive to note that the major forces in favor of recharter were merchants, chambers of commerce, and most of the state banks. Merchants found the bank had expended credit at cheap rates and had eased the eternal complaint about a scarcity of money. Even more suggestive is the support of the state banks, which hailed the bank as advantageous and worried about the contraction of credit if the bank were forced to liquidate. The Bank of New York, which had been founded by Alexander Hamilton, in fact lauded the Bank of the United States because it had been able, in case of any sudden pressure, upon the merchants to step forward to their aid in a degree which the state institutions were unable to do. The War of 1812 and its Aftermath War has generally had grave and fateful consequences for the American monetary and financial system. We have seen that the Revolutionary War occasioned a mass of depreciated fiat paper, worthless continentals, a huge public debt, and the beginnings of central banking in the Bank of North America. The Hamiltonian financial system, and even the Constitution itself, was in large part shaped by the Federalists' desire to fund the federal and state public debt via federal taxation. And a major reason for the establishment of the First Bank of the United States was to contribute to the funding of the newly assumed federal debt. The constitutional prohibition against state paper money and the implicit rebuff to all fiat paper were certainly influenced by the Revolutionary War experience. The War of 1812 to 1815 had momentous consequences for the monetary system. An enormous expansion in the number of banks and in bank notes and deposits was spurred by the dictates of war finance. New England banks were more conservative than in other regions, and the region was strongly opposed to the war with England. So little public debt was purchased in New England. Yet imported goods, textile manufactures, and munitions had to be purchased in that region by the federal government. The government therefore encouraged the formation of new and recklessly inflationary banks in the mid-Atlantic, southern, and western states, which printed huge quantities of new notes, to purchase government bonds. The federal government thereupon used these notes to purchase manufactured goods in New England. Thus, from 1811 to 1815, the number of banks in the country increased from 117 to 212. In addition, there had sprung up 35 private, unincorporated banks, which were illegal in most states, but were allowed to function under war conditions. Specie in the 30 reporting banks, 26% of the total number of 1811, 
amounted to $2.57 million in 1811. This figure had risen to $5.40 million in the 98 reporting banks in 1815, or 40% of the total. Notes and deposits, on the other hand, were $10.5 million in 1811 and had increased to $31.6 million in 1815 among the reporting banks. If we make the heroic assumption that we can estimate the money supply for the country by multiplying by the proportion of unreported banks, and we then add in the Bank of the United States totals for 1811, Specie and all banks would total $14.9 million in 1811 and $13.5 million in 1815, or a 9.4% decrease. On the other hand, total bank notes and deposits aggregated to $42.2 million in 1811 and $79 million four years later. So that's an increase of 87.2%, pyramided on top of a 9.4% decline in specie. If we factor in the Bank of the United States, then, the bank pyramid ratio was 3.70 to 1, and the reserve ratio, 0.27 in 1811. While the pyramid ratio four years later was 5.85 to 1, and the reserve ratio was 0.17. But the aggregates scarcely tell the whole story, since, as we have seen, the expansion took place solely outside of New England, while New England banks continued on their relatively sound basis and did not inflate their credit. The record expansion of the number of banks was in Pennsylvania, which incorporated no less than 41 new banks in the month of March 1814, contrasting to only four banks which had existed in that state, all in Philadelphia, until that date. It is instructive to compare the pyramid ratios of banks in various reporting states in 1815. Only 1 1.96 to 1 in Massachusetts, 2.7 to 1 in New Hampshire, and 2.42 to 1 in Rhode Island, as contrasted to 19.2 to 1 in Pennsylvania, 18.46 to 1 in South Carolina, and 18.73 to 1 in Virginia. This monetary situation meant that the United States government was paying for New England manufactured goods with a mass of inflated paper money outside the region. Soon, as the New England banks called upon the other banks to redeem their notes in specie, the mass of inflating banks faced imminent insolvency. It was at this point that a fateful decision was made by the U.S. government and concurred in by the governments of the states outside New England. As the banks all faced failure, the governments in August 1814 permitted all of them to suspend specie payments, that is, to stop all redemption of notes and deposits in gold or silver, and yet to continue in operation. In short, in one of the most flagrant violations of property rights in American history, the banks were permitted to waive their contractual obligations to pay in specie while they themselves could expand their loans and operations and force their own debtors to repay their loans as usual. Indeed, the number of banks and bank credit expanded rapidly during 1815 as a result of this governmental carte blanche. It was precisely during 1815 when virtually all the private banks sprang up, the number of banks increasing in one year from 208 to 246. Reporting banks increased their pyramid ratios from 3.17 to 1 in 1814 to 5.85 to 1 the following year, a drop of reserve ratios from 0.32 to 0.17. Thus, if we measure bank expansion by pyramiding and reserve ratios, we see that a major inflationary impetus during the War of 1812 came during the year 1815, after specie payments had been suspended throughout the country by government action. Historians dedicated to the notion that central banks restrain state or private bank inflation have placed the blame for the multiplicity of banks and bank credit inflation during the War of 1812 on the absence of a central bank. But, as we have seen, both the number of banks and bank credit grew apace during the period of the First Bank of the United States, pyramiding on top of the latter's expansion, and would continue to do so under the second bank, 
and for that matter the Federal Reserve System in later years. And the federal government, not the state banks themselves, is largely to blame for encouraging new, inflated banks to monetize the war debt. Then, in particular, it allowed them to suspend specie payment in August 1814 and to continue that suspension for two years after the war was over, until February 1817. Thus, For two and a half years, banks were permitted to operate and expand while issuing what was tantamount to fiat paper and bank deposits. Another neglected responsibility of the U.S. government for the wartime inflation was its massive issue of treasury notes to help finance the war effort. While this treasury paper was interest-bearing and was redeemable in specie in one year, the cumulative amount outstanding functioned as money as they were used in transactions among the public and were also employed as reserves or high-powered money by the expanding banks. The fact that the government received the Treasury notes for all debts and taxes gave the notes a quasi-legal tender status. Most of the Treasury notes were issued in 1814 and 1815, when their outstanding total reached $10.65 million dollars, and $15.46 million, respectively. Not only did the Treasury notes fuel the bank inflation, but their quasi-legal tender status brought Gresham's Law into operation and specie flowed out of the banks and public circulation outside New England and into New England and out of the country. The expansion of bank money and Treasury notes during the war drove up prices in the United States. Wholesale price increases from 1811 to 1815 averaged 35 percent, with different cities experiencing a price inflation ranging from 28 percent to 55 percent. Since foreign trade was cut off by the war, prices of imported commodities rose far more, averaging 70 percent. But more important than this inflation, and at least as important as the wreckage of the monetary system during and after the war, was the precedent that a -a two-and-a-half-year-long suspension of specie payment set for the banking system for the future. From then on, every time there was a banking crisis brought on by inflationary expansion and demands for redemption in specie, state and federal governments looked the other way and permitted general suspension of specie payments while bank operations continued to flourish. It thus became clear to the banks that in general crisis they would not be required to meet the ordinary obligations of contract law or of respect for property rights. So their inflationary expansion was permanently encouraged by this massive failure of government to fulfill its obligation to enforce contracts and defend the rights of property. Suspensions of specie payments informally or officially permeated the economy outside of New England during the Panic of 1819, occurred everywhere outside of New England in 1837, and in all states south and west of New Jersey in 1839. A general suspension of specie payments occurred throughout the country once again in the Panic of 1857. It is important to realize, then, in evaluating the American banking system before the Civil War, that even in the later years when there was no central bank, the system was not free in any proper economic sense. Free banking can only refer to a system in which banks are treated as any other business, and that, therefore, failure to obey contractual obligations, in this case prompt redemption of notes and deposits in specie, must incur immediate insolvency and liquidation. Burdened by the tradition of allowing general suspensions that arose in the United States in 1814, the pre-Civil War banking system, despite strong elements of competition when not saddled with a central bank, must rather be termed, in the phrase of one economist, as decentralization without freedom. From the 1814 to 1817 experience on, the notes of state banks circulated at varying rates of depreciation, depending on public expectations of how long they would be able to keep redeeming their obligations in specie. These expectations, in turn, were heavily influenced by the amount of notes 
at deposits issued by the bank as compared with the amount of specie held in its vaults. In that era of poor communications and high transportation costs, the tendency for a bank note was to depreciate in proportion to its distance from the home office. One effective, if time-consuming, method of enforcing redemption on nominally specie-paying banks was the emergence of a class of professional money brokers. These brokers would buy up a mass of depreciated notes of nominally specie-paying banks and then travel to the home office of the bank to demand redemption in specie. Merchants, money brokers, bankers, and the general public were aided in evaluating the various state banknotes by the development of monthly journals known as banknote detectors. These detectors were published by money brokers and periodically evaluated the market rate of various bank notes in relation to specie. Wildcat banks were so named because at that age of poor transportation, banks hoping to inflate and not worry about redemption attempted to locate in wildcat country, where money brokers would find it difficult to travel. It should be noted that if it were not for periodic suspension, there would have been no room for wildcat banks or for varying degrees of lack of confidence in the genuineness of specie redemption at any given time. It can be imagined that the advent of the money broker was not precisely welcomed in the town of an errant bank, and it was easy for the townspeople to blame the resulting collapse of the bank credit on the sinister stranger rather than on the friendly neighborhood banker. During the Panic of 1819, when banks collapsed after an inflationary boom lasting until 1817, obstacles and intimidation were often the lot of those who attempted to press the banks to fulfill their contractual obligation to pay in specie. Thus, Maryland and Pennsylvania, during the Panic of 1819, engaged in almost bizarre inconsistency in this area. Maryland, on February 15, 1819, enacted a law to compel banks to pay specie for their notes or forfeit their charters. Yet two days after this seemingly tough action, it passed another law relieving banks of any obligation to redeem notes held by money brokers. The major force ensuring the people of this state from the evil arising from the demands made on the banks of this state for gold and silver by brokers. Pennsylvania followed suit a month later. In this way, these states could claim to maintain the virtue of enforcing contract and property rights while moving to prevent the most effective method of ensuring such enforcement. During the 1814-1817 general suspension, note holders who sued for specie payments seldom gained satisfaction in the courts. Thus, Isaac Bronson, a prominent Connecticut banker in a specie-paying region, sued various New York banks for payment of notes in specie. He failed to get satisfaction, and for his pains received only abuse in the New York press as an agent of misery and ruin. The banks south of Virginia largely went off specie payments during the Panic of 1819, and in Georgia, at least general suspension continued almost continuously down to the 1830s. One customer complained that during 1819, in order to collect in specie from the largely state-owned Bank of Darien, Georgia, he was forced to swear before a justice of the peace in the bank that each and every note he presented to the bank was his own and that he was not a money broker or an agent for anyone else. He was forced to swear to the oath in the presence of at least five bank directors and the bank's cashier, and he was forced to pay a fee of $1.36 on each note in order to acquire specie on demand. Two years later, when a note holder demanded $30,000 in specie at the Planters Bank of Georgia, he was told he would be paid in pennies only, while another customer was forced to accept pennies handed out to him at the rate of $60 a day. During the panic, North Carolina and Maryland in particular moved against the money brokers in a vain attempt to prop up the depreciated notes of their state's banks. In North Carolina, banks were not penalized by the legislature for suspending specie payments to brokers while maintaining them to others. 
Backed by government, the three leading banks of the state met and agreed in June 1819 not to pay specie to brokers or their agents. Their notes immediately fell to a 15% discount outside the state. However, the banks continued to require, ignoring the inconsistency, that their own debtors pay them at par in specie. Maryland, during the same year, moved to require a license of $500 per year for money brokers, in addition to an enormous $20,000 bond to establish their business. Maryland tried to bolster the defense of banks and the attack on brokers by passing a compulsory par law in 1819, prohibiting the exchange of specie for Maryland banknotes at less than par. The law was readily evaded, however the penalty merely adding to the discount as compensation for the added risk. Specie, furthermore, was driven out of the state by the operation of Gresham's Law. In Kentucky, Tennessee, and Missouri, state laws were passed requiring creditors to accept depreciated and inconvertible bank paper in payment of debts, else suffer the stay of execution of the debt. In this way, quasi-legal tender status was conferred on the paper. Many states permitted banks to suspend specie payment, and for western states, Tennessee, Kentucky, Missouri, and Illinois, established state-owned banks to try to overcome the Depression by issuing large issues of inconvertible paper money. In all states trying to prop up inconvertible bank paper, a quasi-legal status was also conferred on the paper by agreeing to receive the notes in taxes or debts due to the state. The result of all the inconvertible paper schemes was rapid and massive depreciation, disappearance of specie, succeeded by speedy liquidation of the new state-owned banks. An amusing footnote on the problem of banks being protected against their contractual obligations to pay in specie occurred in the course of correspondence between one of the earliest economists in America, the young Philadelphia State Senator Condi Raquette, and the eminent English economist David Ricardo. Ricardo had evidently been bewildered by Raquette's statement that banks technically required to pay in specie were not often called upon to do so. On April 18, 1821, Raquette replied, explaining the power of banks in the United States. You state in your letter that you find it difficult to comprehend why persons who had a right to demand coin from the banks in payment of their notes so long forbore to exercise it. This no doubt appears paradoxical to one who resides in a country where an act of parliament was necessary to protect a bank, but the difficulty is easily solved. The whole of our population are either stockholders of banks or in debt to them. It is not in the interest of the first to press the banks, and the rest are afraid. This is the whole secret. An independent man who was neither a stockholder or debtor, who would have ventured to compel the banks to do justice, would have been persecuted as an enemy of society. The Second Bank of the United States, 1816-1833 to 1833. The United States emerged from the War of 1812 in a chaotic monetary state, with banks multiplying and inflating ad lib, checked only by the varying rates of depreciation of their notes. With banks freed from redeeming their obligations in specie, the number of incorporated banks increased during 1816 from 212 to 232. Clearly, the nation could not continue indefinitely with the issue of fiat money in the hands of discordant sets of individual banks. It was apparent that there were two ways out of the problem. One was the hard money path advocated by the old Republicans and, for their own purposes, the Federalists. The federal and state governments would have sternly compelled the rollicking banks to redeem promptly in specie, and when most of the banks outside of New England could not, to force them to liquidate. In that way, the mass of depreciated and inflated notes and deposits would have been swiftly liquidated, and specie would have poured back out of hordes and into the country to supply a circulating medium. The inflationary experience would have been over. Instead, the Democratic-Republican establishment in 1816 turned to the old Federalist path, a new central bank the second bank of the United States, 
modeled closely after the first bank, the second bank, a private corporation with one-fifth of the shares owned by the federal government, was to create a national paper currency, purchase a large chunk of the public debt, and receive deposits of treasury funds. The BUS notes and deposits were to be redeemable in specie, and they were given quasi-legal tender status by the federal government's receiving them in payment of taxes. That the purpose of establishing the BUS was to support the state banks in their inflationary course, rather than crack down on them, is seen by the shameful deal that the BUS made with the state banks as soon as it opened its doors in January 1817. At the same time it was establishing the BUS in April 1816, Congress passed the resolution of Daniel Webster, at that time a Federalist champion of hard money, requiring that after February 20, 1817, the United States should accept in payments for debts or taxes only specie, treasury notes, BUS notes, or state bank notes redeemable in specie on demand. In short, no irredeemable state bank notes would be accepted after that date. Instead of using the opportunity to compel the banks to redeem, however, the BUS, in a meeting with representatives from the leading urban banks, excluding Boston, agreed to issue $6 million worth of credit in New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Virginia before insisting on specie payments from debts due to it from the state banks. In return for that agreed-upon massive inflation, the state banks graciously consented to resume specie payments. Moreover, the BUS and the state banks agreed to mutually support each other in any emergency, which of course meant in practice that the far stronger BUS was committed to propping up the weaker state banks. The BUS was pushed through Congress by the Madison administration and particularly by Secretary of the Treasury Alexander J. Dallas, whose appointment was lobbied for for that purpose. Dallas, a wealthy Philadelphia lawyer, was a close friend, counsel, and financial associate of Philadelphia merchant and banker Stephen Girard, reputedly one of the two wealthiest men in the country. Toward the end of its term, Girard was the largest stockholder of the first BUS, and during the War of 1812, Girard became a very heavy investor in the war debt of the federal government both as a prospective large stockholder and as a way to unload his public debt, Girard began to agitate for a new BUS. Dallas's appointment as Secretary of Treasury in 1814 was successfully engineered by Dallas and his close friend, wealthy New York merchant and fur trader John Jacob Astor, also a heavy investor in the war debt. When the BUS was established, Stephen Girard purchased the $3 million of the $28 million that remained unsubscribed, and he and Dallas managed to secure for the post of president of the new bank their good friend, William Jones, former Philadelphia merchant. Much of the opposition to the founding of the BUS seems keenly prophetic. Thus, Senator William H. Wells, Federalist from Delaware, in arguing against the bank bill, said that it was ostensibly for the purpose of correcting the diseased state of our paper currency by restraining and curtailing the overissue of bank paper, and yet it came prepared to inflict upon us the same evil, being itself nothing more than simply a paper-making machine. In fact, the result of the deal with the state banks was that their resumption of specie payment after 1817 was more nominal than real, thereby setting the stage for the widespread suspensions of the 1819-1821 depression. As Bray Hamilton writes, specie payments were resumed with substantial shortcomings. Apparently, the situation was better than it had been, and a pretense was maintained of its being better than it was. But redemption was not certain and universal. There was still a premium on specie and still a discount on banknotes, with considerable variation in both from place to place. Three years later, February 1820, Secretary of the Treasury Crawford reported to Congress that during the greater part of the time that had elapsed since the resumption of specie payments, the convertibility of banknotes into specie had been nominal rather than real, in the largest portion of the Union. 
One problem is that the BUS lacked the courage to insist on payment of its notes from state banks. As a result, state banks had large balances piled up against them at the BUS, totaling over $2.4 million during 1817 and 1818, remaining on the books as virtual interest-free loans. As Catterall points out, so many influential people were interested in the state banks as stockholders that it was not advisable to give offense by demanding payment in specie, and borrowers were anxious to keep the banks in the humor to lend. When the BUS did try to collect on the state banknotes in specie, President Jones reported, the banks, our debtors, plead inability, require unreasonable indulgence, or treat our reiterated claims and expostulations with settled indifference. From its inception, the second BUS launched a spectacular inflation of money and credit. Lax about insisting on the required payment of its capital in specie, the bank failed to raise the $7 million legally supposed to have been subscribed in specie. Instead, during 1817 and 1818, its specie held never rose above $2.5 million. At the peak of its initial expansion, in July 1818, BUS specie totaled $2.36 million, and its aggregate notes and deposits totaled $21.8 million. Thus, in a scant year and a half of operation, the BUS had added a net of $19.2 million to the nation's money supply for a pyramid ratio of 9.24, or a reserve ratio of 0.11. Outright fraud abounded at the BUS, especially at the Philadelphia and Baltimore branches, particularly the latter. It is no accident that three-fifths of all the BUS loans were made at these two branches. Also, the BUS' attempt to provide a uniform currency throughout the nation floundered on the fact that the western and southern branches could inflate credit and banknotes and that the inflated notes would win their way to the more conservative branches in New York and Boston which would be obligated to redeem the inflated notes at par. In this way, the conservative branches were stripped of specie while the western branches could continue to inflate unchecked. The expansionary operations of the BUS, coupled with its laxity toward insisting on specie payment by the state banks, impelled a further inflationary expansion of state banks on top of the spectacular enlargement of the central bank. Thus, the number of incorporated state banks rose from 232 in 1816 to 338 in 1818. Kentucky alone chartered 40 new banks in the 1817-1818 legislative session. The estimated total money supply in the nation rose from $67.3 million in 1816 to $94.7 million in 1818, a rise of 40.7% in two years. Most of this increase was supplied by the BUS. The huge expansion of money and credit impelled a full-scale inflationary boom throughout the country. Import prices had fallen in 1815 with the renewal of foreign trade after the war, but domestic prices were another story. Thus, the index of export staples in Charleston rose from 102 in 1815 to 160 in 1818. The prices of Louisiana staples at New Orleans rose from 178 to 224 in the same period. Other parts of the economy boomed. Exports rose from 81 million in 1815 to a peak of 116 million in 1818. Prices rose greatly in real estate, land, farm improvement projects, and slaves, much of it fueled by the use of a bank credit for speculation in urban and rural real estate. There was a boom in turnpike construction, furthered by vast federal expenditures to turnpikes. Freight rates rose on steamboats and shipbuilding shared in the general prosperity. Also, general boom conditions expanded stock trading so rapidly that traders, who had been buying and selling stocks on the curbs on Wall Street for nearly a century, found it necessary to open the first indoor stock exchange in the country, the New York Stock Exchange in March 1817. Also, investment banking began in the United States during this boom period. Starting in July 1818, the government and the BUS began to see what dire straits they were in. In 
The enormous inflation of money and credit, aggravated by the massive fraud, had put the BUS in real danger of going under and illegally failing to sustain specie payments. Over the next year, the BUS began a series of heroic contractions. Forced curtailment of loans, contractions of credit in the South and West, refusal to provide uniform national currency by redeeming its shaky branch notes at par, and seriously enforcing the requirement that its debtor banks redeem in specie. In addition, it purchased millions of dollars of specie from abroad. These heroic actions, along with the ouster of President William Jones, managed to save the BUS, but the massive contraction of money and credit swiftly brought the United States its first widespread economic and financial depression. The first nationwide boom-bust cycle had arrived in the United States, impelled by rapid and massive inflation, quickly succeeded by contraction of money and credit. Banks failed, and private banks curtailed their credits and liabilities and suspended specie payments in most parts of the country. Contraction of money and credit by the BUS was almost unbelievable. Total notes and deposits falling from $21.9 million in June 1818 to $11.5 million only a year later. The money supply contributed by the BUS was thereby contracted by no less than 47.2% in one year. The number of incorporated banks at first remained the same and then fell rapidly from 1819 to 1822, falling from 341 in mid-1819 to 267 three years later. Total notes and deposits of state banks fell from an estimated $72 million in mid-1818 to $62.7 million a year later, a drop of 14% in one year. If we add in the fact that the U.S. Treasury contracted total Treasury notes from $8.81 million to zero during this period, we get the following estimated total money supply. In 1818, $103.5 million dollars. In 1819, $74.2 million, a contraction in one year of 28.3%. The result of the contraction was a massive rash of defaults, bankruptcies of businesses and manufacturers, and liquidation of unsound investments during the boom. There was a vast drop in real estate values and rents and in the prices of freight rates and of slaves. Public land sales dropped greatly as a result of the contraction, declining from $13.6 million in 1818 to $1.7 million in 1820. Prices, in general, plummeted. The index of export staples fell from 158 in November 1818 to 77 in June 1819, an annualized drop of 87.9% during those seven months. South Carolina export staples dropped from 160 to 96 from 1818 to 1819, and commodity prices in New Orleans dropped from 200 in 1818 to 119 two years later. Falling money incomes led to a precipitous drop in imports, which fell from $122 million in 1818 to $87 million the year later. Imports from Great Britain fell from $43 million in 1818 to $14 million in 1820, and cotton and woolen imports from Britain fell from over $14 million each in the former year to about $5 million in the latter. The great fall in prices aggravated the burden of money debts, reinforced by the contraction of credit. Bankruptcies abounded, and one observer estimated that $100 million of mercantile debts to Europe were liquidated by bankruptcy during the crisis. Western areas, shorn of money by the collapse of the previously swollen paper and debt, often returned to barter conditions, and grain and whiskey were used as media of exchange. In the dramatic summing up of the hard-money economist and historian William Googe, by his precipitous and dramatic contraction, the bank was saved and the people were ruined.